Hi, it's Carolyn here. Before you start listening to this episode, I just wanted to let you know that I'm currently in Switzerland doing my very own and long overdue trip around the country. I'm visiting some of the most popular destinations in Switzerland, as well as a number of lesser known places. And I'm traveling around by both car and train. If you'd like to follow along with my Swiss travels to see where I am and what I'm doing, make sure you follow Holidays to Switzerland on Instagram. That's Holidays number two Switzerland. Here I'll be sharing photos and reels as I go, and I'd love you to follow along. Now, settle back and enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Holidays to Switzerland Travel Podcast. Your host is the founder of Holidays to Switzerland.com and the Switzerland Travel Planning Facebook group, Carolyn Schonefinger. On this podcast, Carolyn will be joined by a variety of guests who share their knowledge and love of the country to help you plan your dream trip to Switzerland. Grüezi, and welcome to episode 31 of the podcast. I'm your host, Carolyn, and I'm really excited that you're joining me today. Before we get started talking all things Swiss food, I wanted to say a huge thank you to every single listener. Someone asked me recently, who listens to your podcast? And whilst I know that lots of listeners live in North America, Australia and the UK, I thought I'd see where else our listeners come from. I was shocked, but very pleasantly surprised, to discover that the podcast has been listened to in 87 countries, which just blows my mind. Listeners have tuned in from across Europe, from Japan, Brazil, and Puerto Rico, to name just a few countries. I'm truly humbled that I have the opportunity to help you discover more about Switzerland, and I hope that each episode provides you with travel tips and inspiration to help make your Swiss trip a reality. Of course, when you are in Switzerland, you'll want to enjoy some Swiss cuisine. Cheese and chocolate are the most well known Swiss foods. But there are many other dishes, both seasonal and those available year-round, that feature on the menus across the country. Whilst I've had the opportunity to enjoy many traditional Swiss meals, and thoroughly enjoyed them, I should add, I thought it would be interesting to delve a bit deeper and learn about the history of these dishes. So, who better to ask than a Swiss-Canadian pastry chef who has lived in Switzerland for over 10 years and has produced her own Swiss cookbooks? My guest today is Andy Pilot, who, as well as writing her amazing cookbooks, shares Swiss recipes on her website, Helvetic Kitchen. Just looking at the photos of Andy's dishes on her website has my mouth watering, so I can't wait to chat with her today. Hi, Andy. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. I'm really looking forward to hearing all about this delicious Swiss food. Oh, it's my pleasure. I love talking anything Swiss food. Excellent. Now it's almost uh, dinner time here where I am, so I know by the end of our our chat I'm going to be really, really hungry. I hope so. Craving cheese and chocolate. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Okay, so let's um, let's start by um, hearing about your story. You've got a, an accent there, which I know is Canadian, but you are um, a resident of Switzerland. So how did how did that all all come about? Yeah, well, I grew up in Canada, in Calgary, uh, near the Rocky Mountains. And today I live near the Swiss Alps, which is really wonderful. My connection to Switzerland is through my mother. She is Swiss. She grew up in Switzerland and left uh, when she was a young woman. First, she went to England and then eventually immigrated to Canada, where she met my dad and stayed for 50 years. Um, And... Yeah, I trained in Canada to be a pastry chef. Mm -hmm. And once I had finished that, I wanted to get some practical experience being a pastry chef. And I came to Switzerland. I worked a bit in bakeries and yeah, got gained lots of new skills living in Switzerland and and being here. I fell in love with the country. I met my husband and it's been 10 years since I've been here and I love it. So Wonderful. So I think I read um, on your website that as a child, you you used to go back to Switzerland from Canada fairly regularly um, because you had had grandparents and and family there. So what sort of memories do you have from that time that 
is, is there anything that you think sort of maybe shaped your decision to become a, a pastry chef? I think absolutely, because most of my memories from Switzerland as a child are food memories. I remember being really excited to drink um, fizzy apple juice. Uh, that was one really exciting thing. That was the first thing I always asked my mother to buy when we went to Switzerland and to, to eat gipfully the croissants that you get here, buttery and delicious. That, those were two of my favorite things. Of course, Swiss chocolate. My mother also was very um, strict about what kind of chocolate we were allowed in our house in Canada. And that was only Swiss chocolate. <laughs> and she was a snob about cheese too, which I appreciate now. And so we always had the best cheese and chocolate. Um, and yeah, just, just experiencing another food culture as a child was, was important to me and interesting. And, um, yeah, definitely led to my interest in food and cooking. And I wanted to recreate those things that I had eaten in Switzerland for sure. Wonderful. So what, um, when you first moved to Switzerland and, and you said you, you worked in a few bakeries and things, was there something that you found when you're working in those bakeries that, you know, this is the kind of food that I want to be creating for the rest of my life? Absolutely. I think um, the seasonality of the food is really important to me. I really love that, uh, say, for example, strawberries. In Switzerland, you get strawberries when they're growing outside and that's about it. And people really look forward to strawberry season and the bakeries are just stuffed full of strawberry tarts and strawberry cakes and you get all your strawberries when they taste so good. They're perfect. And, and then after the strawberry season is over, you can't find them anymore and you have to wait till the next year. And I really like that idea of seasonality. It's the same with chestnuts. That's one of my favorites in the fall to have chestnuts. There are so many different kinds of desserts. You have them with savory meals as well. And they really go full on chestnut season and then you can't find them anymore. And that looking forward to the next dish or the next food product in, in the season and being connected with the season and the time of year, that's really important. And I really love that about, about Switzerland. Yeah. Now we are going to talk more about your favorite foods and and, and some specific uh, Swiss foods in a little bit. Uh, but can you start by telling us are there any sort of cultural differences um, that you that you notice or that you have noticed between meal times and 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 the the preparation of meals in in Switzerland compared to what you were used to in Canada? Absolutely. Um, I mean, seasonality, of course, is is one of those things. They're hugely, what you eat is hugely dependent on the growing season and things like that. Um, and then just the fact that lunchtime is your biggest meal of the day. And that was different from in Canada when dinner was, was your biggest meal of the day. And really, the whole society here is uh, geared towards having a big lunch. Um, children go home from school to have a big lunch with their family. Plenty of workers also take a long lunch break, go home, and that's your warm cooked meal of the day. Um, and we live way out in the countryside in the Emmental and every shop is closed, every business is closed and the people really go home to their houses. They eat a warm meal and then they go back in the afternoon to work. And that, I mean, that's hugely different. When I went to school in Canada, I took a sandwich with me and I, you know, went home at the end of the day and here my daughter comes home every day. Is that still a practice in the cities as well? Not quite as much as in the countryside, but I mean, you still do notice it that there are little shops that are closed over lunchtime and just that the menus at restaurants, they have their, their daily menu. That's a warm meal for, for lunch and dinner is then uh, maybe a less Im important meal or you're definitely not eating quite as much uh, with my relatives in Switzerland or my husband's relatives, they were always just having a little bit of leftovers, a little bit of bread and cheese for dinner. And that was, that was about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how about on the weekends? Is, is there a one, one day that families really like to, to get together to, to enjoy a meal? Sure. I mean, brunch is also really popular here on a Sunday and it's very excellent. You almost always see, uh, sop. The braided bread that's very famous here. Well, it's called tress in the in the French part of the country. That's always the feature. 
it's beautiful and buttery. There's butter and jam and honey to go with it. And depending on uh, how big your brunch is, there are meats and cheeses and all sorts of things like that too. And that's often a family thing or many um, restaurants throughout the country also will offer a big, a big brunch on Sunday that you can go to. And here again, in the Emmental, we have lots of farms around and there's always a, a farmer's brunch on Sunday where you just have a big buffet, usually pay a flat rate and just stuff your face with uh zop and lots of fresh butter. You see the cows that have made the butter in the field next mm. to the restaurant. And it's, it was really wonderful. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Okay. So when people are visiting Switzerland, particularly if, if they're going there for the first time, um, I guess they're going to see some dishes on the menu that they're probably not so familiar with. So I'm going to ask you about some of those dishes that they might come across and, and just ask you to give us a bit more info about them, their origins and, and when when we can expect to eat these meals and, and what the ingredients are and so on, um, just to give people a bit of a heads up so they, they know. <laughs> uh, so let's start with breakfast. There's a, a particular Swiss dish that you often see on breakfast menus. That's right. And that's a uh, beer muesli. That's named after its founder, Oscar Maximilian Bircher Benner. And he was a doctor. He worked in Zurich at the beginning of the 20th century. And he had a sanatorium in Zurich and he treated many patients over the decades. And he really was into the idea of raw foodism, sort of veganism before it became popular. And he had had jaundice as a child and did a kind of self-cure where he ate raw apples. And then he made this muesli, a little mush, as it's translated to. Um, and in it, he put the raw apples, he put lemon juice and oats, and all the patients at a sanatorium were served this before every meal. And I mean, their entire diet there consisted of different kinds of raw food. And over the years, this sort of uh, changed and developed into the beer community that we know today, which also has the oats and often raw apples. But now people have added yogurt to it. It's very creamy. Um, it's very popular today. You also see it called sometimes overnight oats. Uh, but really, it's beer community. And we can thank uh, Dr. Bircher Benner for it. Um, today, it's prepared very differently from, from this raw food version. And uh, I worked once at a bakery and they gave me a little pot of the their Bircher muesli for my break. And I ate it. I thought, wow, this is the best Bircher muesli I've ever had. It was creamy. It was delicious. It had berries in it, yogurt. I thought, wow. And then after I came back from my break, they asked me to make it and they gave me the recipe and half of it was whipped cream. And I thought, oh, wow, that is very different from the healthy sort of breakfast that I expected it to be. So when you're in Switzerland, be aware that there are many different kinds of beer community. Some are healthier than others. Uh, mm -hmm. Some are really just like yogurt and oats and fruit, and that's wonderful. But some of them are really decadent and they have cream and, and sugar added to them as well. Um, it's something you'll find if you're at a hotel buffet. I'm sure there's usually a big bowl of beer community you can help yourself to. In my family, um, my grandmother made it as a dinner, actually. We often ate it uh, in on warm summer nights when it was really hot. She would make beer community for dinner instead. It's a really nice dinner. It's refreshing. And you can buy it at every supermarket in little plastic containers. And it's great after a hike, too. It's a really nice, versatile, versatile dish. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I wouldn't wouldn't have thought of it as uh, as something for dinner. I've always only ever seen it, yeah, as you say, on on the buffet in in hotels. So yeah, that's good to know. But the the creamy version is definitely a bit of a um <laughs> a, a bit different to how uh, Mr. Berker um, intended it, isn't it? Absolutely, yep. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we've had breakfast. Um, Everyone in that goes to Switzerland hears about fondue and another cheese dish is raclette. So often they, they can be a bit confused or people don't really know what the difference is if they haven't been to Switzerland before. So can you tell us a bit about those um, and how they're served and, and, and what they're served with? Absolutely. Um, so they're both kinds of melty cheese. 
Uh, fondue is when you get a big pot, you put all the cheese in the pot, there's a little bit of white wine in there. And then you have long forks, you skewer some bread or maybe boiled potatoes, you dip it in the melty cheese, you all eat it together. And typically, um, it's more of a winter dish. My husband would say, no, you only have raclette in the winter. But for me, I love to have it year round because it's one of my favorite things to eat. And surely on a cold uh, summer evening in the mountains, you could definitely eat a fondue. And if you're a tourist in Switzerland, definitely eat a fondue, no matter what the time of year. Um, he would say that raclette is more of a summer summer dish. We always have our raclette in the summer. Um, and that is, in historically, uh, farmers would have had, or not farmers, alpine herdsmen would have had big wheels of cheese with them. And when they were up on the Alp, they would have left it near the fire and the top part of the cheese would just start to melt. And then they would take that wheel of cheese and scrape the top part off onto their bread or their potatoes or whatever they're eating. And um, the word in French for that, because this was taking place in the Valais and the French part of the canton was raclée. And that became the raclette cheese. And now they make uh, this raclette cheese. Um, in some restaurants, you'll see it still as a big wheel of cheese. They have a big oven. They stick it under the oven. The top layer gets melty and delicious. And they maybe even come to your, come to your table and they'll scrape that cheese right off the top. Um, that's one way you might see it served in Switzerland. Uh, but generally, if, if you're just in a family or in other restaurants, they have little raclette ovens, little electric ovens with little trays. The cheese is cut into squares. You can pop that in the tray, put it in the oven, and a few minutes later, you have your melty cheese to scrape over your plate of potatoes or pickles or or sometimes um, cured meats. And in some places, when you put the 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 plain cheese on the tray, you can also add some onions or something else, and that gets melted into the cheese. A little bit of bacon, maybe, and then you scrape that over your potatoes. Mm, delicious. And that delicious. is how you typically have raclette, yeah. Yeah. And is there um, p- a particular kind of cheese that's used for both fondue and, and raclette? So raclette is its own cheese. You can buy raclette cheese. And what they usually do is they flavor it in many different ways. We have a little dairy in our town and you can buy probably 12 different kinds of raclette cheese. Um, there will be garlic flavored or with chili or with peppercorns or with truffles or all sorts of different things that are already inside the cheese or just plain raclette or smoked raclette. And that in itself is like a protected brand product. It's like a cheese of itself, like Gruyere is a cheese. And um, then for fondue, that really depends on what region you are in Switzerland. Uh, traditionally, yeah, when I was a child in Canada, my mom made it always a mix of Gruyere cheese and Vacherin cheese from the Fribourg region. And that is like a pretty standard kind. My friend lives in Fribourg and she only ever makes it with pure Vacherin. Sometimes you see it with Emmental mixed in. Um, and lately, uh, other kinds of cheeses have been used like Appenzell or you can find it. Usually wherever you are in the country, they will kind of have their own special cheese mix. Um, we live, yeah, in the Emmental, we have a mix from our local dairy. It doesn't have Emmental cheese in it, but a local mountain cheese is really delicious. The thing I love about fondue too is it's kind of like Switzerland's fast food. Um, you can sell, they sell it in these like vacuum packed bags and you can get it. It has everything in it already. It has your wine in it, your cornstarch. You literally just pour it into your fondue pot, warm it, give it a stir and you're ready to go. You can buy pickles at your local gas station. You can buy this fondue mix. You can buy the bread and in a matter of minutes, you have a fondue on the go. It's, <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah. Wonderful. There's no excuse then not to enjoy a fondue. <laughs> All you need is a pot and, and the forks. Yeah. Great. Okay, so we've we've had the the cheese. What about um, potatoes? I know there's um, a side dish, I guess you would call it, um, that's very similar to hash brown and it's um, rösti, I think it's pronounced. That's exactly right. Yeah, great pronunciation. Yeah, rösti. Thank you. <laughs> um, this is... 
this started out as a farmer's breakfast, actually. They usually would have um, what's called kshrelti, and that's like a little boiled potato. It's been boiled in its skin, and maybe they have it for dinner one night, and the next morning, the whoever was in the kitchen would grate those little boiled potatoes. They'd fry it up in a lot of butter, and that would be the farmer's breakfast before they went out into the fields. And of course, it's super delicious. It's really not a, not very complicated, just potatoes fried in butter. Um, but it became really popular all over the country. And you're right, it's quite often served as a side dish. You see it on the side of, of bratwurst with that brown sauce or um, a specialty in Zurich called Zurich Schnetzlitz. It's mm-hmm. often served like that with, with, and again, with like a creamy brown sauce. Um, and I've seen it more recently also served as its own dish. Sometimes it comes to your table in a little uh, cast iron pan. And when it's served as its own dish, then they often put some cheese on it. Maybe it's a local cheese. They throw a sunny side up egg on top. And um, that's wonderful too. It's filling. It's delicious. And yeah, you can't really beat fried potatoes, fried in butter. Like I said, you're making my mouth water, <laughs> and I, I do love it with that um, the, that veal veal dish from Zurich. That's just amazing. Yeah, they're the the perfect. It's a the perfect accompaniment for it. Alpine macaroni. I'll let you pronounce it in in German. Yeah, Alpler macaroni. Um, that's another great dish uh, with an interesting history. It's also linked to the Alps. Um, this is one that the Alpine herdsmen made up on the Alp. Uh, sometimes maybe you don't think of pasta with Switzerland, but actually it was a really great resource early in the 20th century when these Alpine herdsmen would take all the cows up to the Alp for the summer. And when they did that, they had to bring with them the food they needed for the summer. Of course, they could maybe plant a small garden. Maybe they have potatoes up there or they'd have tons of milk and cheese from the cows. Um, but they needed sort of a light calorie dense thing to bring with them. And they brought pasta. Um, so they had pasta on the Alp. They would bring a big pot of milk to the boil. They'd throw in some of the potatoes they had. They'd throw in this pasta and then they'd grate a bunch of cheese into it stir it and they'd have this really delicious cheesy creamy kind of like macaroni and cheese dish up on the alp and here in switzerland they love serving uh applesauce with lots of these creamy dishes so you would always have applesauce now if you see it today you always have applesauce with it um sometimes they serve sausages with it roasted onions it's just a great dish you often see it if you're hiking in switzerland you often find it in in mountain restaurants and stuff um yeah, delicious. Mm, yum. Okay, and there is a, a special sausage that's um, quite unique to, to Switzerland, isn't there? That's right. That's um, Cervola. You find it throughout the country, and it's definitely the most popular sausage that you would be grilling um, over an open fire if you go camping or if you go on a hike during the day. My daughter is in kindergarten and every Wednesday she brings a servola with her to her kindergarten class and they go out in the forest and they build a fire and they grill their servola and eat it. So it's, it's not only just popular in Switzerland, it's really integrated into even, even the curriculum of the schools. Yeah. Wow, that's um, fantastic. Yeah. Um, and what makes it so special? It's, uh, it has a unique, taste i mean it's not a complicated sausage but it's really just it tastes really good and you find it all over the country and definitely try it out when you're in switzerland you also find it um on lakeside grills and stuff Uh, yeah okay and i know that in all the different regions there's there's sort of the local specialties um in each different region but are all those things that we all those dishes that we've just talked about you can find them pretty much all over the country That's absolutely right. Yeah. These are kind of like the standard Swiss dishes that you, you'll find in Switzerland from the Italian part, the French part, the German part, uh, all over the country. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. So what about, um, your favorite dishes? If, if you, if you had to cook something, or if you were cooking up something and you, you thought, right, I'm going to cook my all time favorite, what would it be? So it's my very favorite thing to eat is 
something that is very seasonal to Switzerland and it's coming up in the season now, which is fall. And that's called the Wild Teller. This is like the hunting plate. Um, you find it in all the restaurants in September, October, November, and it just has all my favorite things on it. So you get a plate that comes to your table or you can prepare it at home. It has spätzle on it. So those like little dumplings also called knöpfli sometimes. It has uh, Brussels sprouts. It has caramelized chestnuts and red cabbage that's sort of cooked often in um, apple juice. So it has a really nice sweet flavor. And then you have the meat part of it. It's really easy to have this as a vegetarian plate too, which I often do. Um, but if you have really nice wild, which is the word for, for game, the meat game, um, then it's, it's cooked in, uh, in a dark sauce. It's been marinated in that sauce for weeks and weeks. Um, in the olden, olden days, the sauce was thick and thickened with blood. I think they don't do this anymore, but I've seen some places where they've used chocolate cocoa to thicken the sauce to make, um, to make this uh, specialty that's on the side there. And that's my favorite. And then dessert is called vermicelle. And that's like a paste of chestnuts. And they squeeze it. <laughs> they squeeze it through a, a press that makes it look almost like spaghetti. Mm. It's like kind of like a garlic press, isn't it? Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> described as chestnut spaghetti and and that's for dessert and even better than just a bowl of that is when you get um it as a coupe and that's when it has ice cream added to it a little bit of whipped cream and it's it's just divine that's my favorite <laughs> <laughs> sounds delicious so what about um other desserts are there are there any other specialties to switzerland that we should be on the lookout for yeah, I think um basically you can't go wrong in most in most Swiss bakeries that have a nice looking uh cake section. There's so many beautiful delicious cakes. Uh some of the really traditional ones that are really special in Switzerland. Um the biggest one is maybe the Zuger Kirschtorte. This one, I always think it must be the the most famous Swiss cake because when I went to pastry school in Canada, um, we did like cakes of the world and that was the one representative cake we made from Switzerland. Um, it is layers of meringue and sponge and it has lots and lots of kirsch. So the, the strong cherry, uh, spirit that they make here in Switzerland. It's boozy. It, it's not for kids, but it's really, really wonderful. I've made it for many, many years and, um, my, husband's family his aunt is like the famous Zuger Kirschtorte maker in their family and I just never could really make it quite as good as hers even though I'm a, a trained pastry chef I thought why is mine <laughs> never quite as good and my father my mother-in-law finally uh, revealed to me uh, last year that it's because she uses full proof Kirsch they live on a farm and they have like 80 percent Kirsch to make her torch and so she's been using this like double so strong Kirsch to make it and I thought oh, okay I just need to get the stronger booze and then the cake <laughs> is just as good as hers um but anyway that's one you can find it all over Switzerland if you want the original you can go to the the Swiss city of Zug and they they have the bakery where you know famously Audrey Hepburn went to this bakery and had a piece of Zuger Kirsch Torte or they sent it to Charlie Chaplin when he lived in the French part of Switzerland and Winston Churchill ate it and it has a long history of many famous people enjoying uh, this cake so that's one the other dessert that I always suggest people get is are these um, ice cream coupes it's, it's called a coupe here, but uh, we would maybe know it as a Sunday ice cream Sundays. And that also, the really good thing about this is it's also very regional. Um, so they'll have standard ones like there's coupe Romanoff, which is a strawberry coupe, which you have during strawberry season, or there's coupe Denmark. And that is just plain vanilla ice cream with chocolate sauce. You get a little um, little pitcher full of chocolate sauce that you pour yourself on top. And this is, it's really exciting to get that, to do that pouring of the chocolate on top. That's a standard one you'll find in probably most restaurants throughout the country. Um, but then there are regional favorites and seasonal coupes. But I mean, the ice cream is really good. Obviously, milk products in Switzerland are really important. And, uh, yeah, you usually can't go wrong getting something with, with ice cream. 
Yeah. And I've noticed too in, in a lot of the, the cake shops that a lot of the cakes have have a custard in them too, which obviously is a, a milk product. And, and as you mentioned before, that the seasonal fruit, um, I mean, they're almost, they look too, too good to eat almost. Absolutely. They really do, yes. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, also drinks because um, that's something that there's, I know there's a couple of quite unique drinks to Switzerland, so maybe you can tell us a bit about those. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So Switzerland has one sort of famous soft drink. It's called Rivella, and that I always suggest for people to try it out when they're here because you can only get it in Switzerland. And of course, as we were just on the topic of milk, it is made with whey, the byproduct of milk making. And for a long time, uh, they touted it as sort of to have special health benefits from using this whey. But by this time, it's been, uh, I don't think you can, I don't think it has these special health benefits. It's just a soft drink, but it has an interesting flavor. It's a little bit like, less spicy ginger ale or um, you really have to try it out for yourself for a milk soft drink. You can find it anywhere in Switzerland, Rivella. Um, and the other drink that is also very popular here, I really like having it also milk related is, is Ovaltine. You can have this in any, in any restaurant. It's a nice sort of afternoon drink. If you don't feel like having a coffee, you can order a warm or a cold here. It's called Oval Martin, Oval Martin. Um, and it has a slightly different name because I guess when they patented it in Great Britain in, I think, 1908 or something, they misspelled it on the patent application. So in the English speaking <laughs> world, it's known as Oval Teen. And here in Switzerland, it's called Ovo Maltine or Ovo. And that's nice. It's not sweetened as much here in Switzerland as it is in some other parts of the world. So it's also kind of like a not too sweet, nice, warm hug of a drink for for a cold afternoon or on the ski slopes. Uh, So that's a good one I like too. Hmm. And when people come to Switzerland, I always uh, suggest that they try Swiss wine. If you're a wine lover, maybe you haven't heard a lot about Swiss wine, but it is really one of Switzerland's best kept secrets. Uh, Switzerland always ranks within the 10 top 10 countries of, of wine consumers per capita, but really they only export about one to 2% per year of their wine because they keep it all here and they drink it themselves because it's really good. (laughs) Chocolate, cheese and wine. Mm -hmm. It's no wonder the Swiss are happy, is it? Yeah, that's right. (laughs) (laughs) They've got the three best things. When when people are traveling around and and they're going out for meals, dining at a a restaurant or even at, at their hotel restaurant, is there anything that they should be aware of or any sort of particular etiquette rules um, that they should keep in mind when they're heading into the restaurant? Yeah, some of the things I noticed uh, when I moved here uh, that were different from from what I was used to in Canada is that tips are included when, when you eat at a restaurant here. All your tax and tips are included. Generally, you would round up when you're paying uh, for a meal but you don't have to tip a certain percentage to your server. That's one thing. Um, also that most hotels and restaurants are only serving their meals at meal times, if that makes sense. So you can get lunch maybe from, yeah, maybe if you're lucky from 1130 till 230, that's quite generous, sometimes just from 12 till two. And then after that, their kitchen closes. And if you try to get a meal at three o'clock, you know, on a weekday, you might be out of luck. So that's just one thing to be aware of. That's not every restaurant. And in lots of tourist regions, you know, they'll have some that are are serving food throughout the day. But it is definitely just something to be aware of if you're looking for a restaurant. Um, the other thing uh, is that uh, in Canada, it's I always felt it, it, you typically if you wanted to just go and get a coffee somewhere, you would go specifically to a coffee shop or to a bakery. But in Switzerland, you can also go to a restaurant or a hotel, sit, have a coffee and just leave without having a meal. You can say that you're just coming for drinks or you're just coming to have a dessert in the afternoon and then leave. You don't I don't I feel like you don't have that same obligation where you if you go to a restaurant, you have to sit down and have the whole meal and uh, and do it that way. So that's another thing to be aware of. 
Okay. Um, I was going to ask you also about um, about water because oh, um, I know I know when um, often I've been in a restaurant in Switzerland and maybe not so much now because I'm aware of it. But initially, like you'd go into a restaurant and you'd order water, and they bring bring the bottle and it's usually sparkling water. And it costs a lot. <laughs> what What's the real etiquette rule around water? Um, and can can you ask for it from from the faucet? I'm so glad you mentioned this. This yeah, that was also a huge a huge different difference as to in Canada. And I feel like there it's it's getting a little bit better here, but it's it's still not quite a standardized rule across the country. We found it really depends on the kind of restaurant you go to. In some places, you can ask for for tap water, Hanewasser, or a carafe d'eau if you're in the French part, and they will just bring you water from the tap and it's fine. Some restaurants, they they will have something on the menu that says, if you're asking for tap water, we still will charge you for that as well. Maybe you have to pay two francs, but it's unlimited, things like that. And then in, in some of the really more modern restaurants, um, there's a famous vegetarian chain of restaurants called Tibbets. You'll find it in most Swiss um, railway stations. I can really recommend it. It's excellent food. And they have like a little station on the side where you can just help yourself to free glasses of water, which maybe that's the way it's moving. But otherwise, if you ask for water, they're going to bring it to you from a bottle usually, and you're going to pay for it. You're going to pay as much as a cup of coffee for that water and be aware of that because it is shocking and surprising when that happens. I know um, in, in the past we've we've paid less for a, a glass of beer or wine than we, than we have for the water. I drank beer all the time because it was cheaper than water. I thought, wow, this is great. Yeah. And when you're in a country that's there's so much free water at, at fountains when you're walking around, I, I always tell people, take your water bottle, fill it up, you know, and if you do really need to drink some water in the restaurant, just try not to make it look too obvious. Absolutely. Such a good tip. Yeah, you can really drink from almost any fountain in the whole country. <laughs> Now, I'd like to ask you about your cookbooks because um, I know as we speak just last week you um, have a brand new one coming out, but you've you've got a couple of other cookbooks as well. So um, what what would you like to tell us about those? Sure, yeah, thanks. Um, I started writing the cookbook sort of as a continuation of my blog, the first one. I have a blog, Helvetic Kitchen, and that is just Swiss recipes Initially, I had started it um, as a way to connect with my friends who lived back in Canada who con continuously asked me for maybe my mother's Christmas cookie recipes or my fondue recipe. And I thought, I'll just put it on a blog and then everyone can see it easily. And um, it turned into being a really nice little niche. Not a lot of people were writing about Swiss food in English. So um, then I just was really excited to try out new recipes from all over the country and from there, I was able to write my first cookbook, Helvetic Kitchen, which is Swiss cooking. Um, and that's all in English. And then a year later, I wrote a book about drinks and drinking culture in Switzerland, which I'm really um, interested in and passionate about, along, uh, as well as the three drinks that I mentioned before. Yeah, there's just so much, um, so many interesting Swiss drink traditions. Um, and wines and beers and spirits. They have a real interesting long tradition of making spirits out of fruit. So like Kirsch out of cherries and, and different ones from apricots and plums. And uh, yeah, that was really interesting. That book is called Drink Like the Swiss. And in the last year, I made a book about cookies, Swiss cookies. So that, that was a really fun project to work on. I got um, to use all my grandmother's old cookie recipes, the grandmother of my husband. They gave me a big box of all her recipes. She had been trained in a domestic school um, here in Switzerland. So she had interesting textbooks. She had all her notes from her classes and stuff like that. So what mm -hmm. I did with that was um, I basically went back and took all the most traditional Swiss cookies I could find. I looked at my grandmother's recipe for it. I looked at my husband's grandmother's recipe. I looked at lots of textbooks from different domestic schools, from from Betty Bossy, from all the most uh, known 
entities in the Swiss culinary world. And um, I tried to find the easiest and best uh, recipes. And I put them all in this book about Swiss cookies. It's interesting too, because there's lots of regional cookies that are not known throughout the country. Um, yeah. And that one was published just last week in English and also in German. So that was exciting. Okay. So after you made all these cookies, did you then photograph them all as well? Yeah. These ones we all um, photographed in house. My husband helped a lot too. He's a, a keen a hobby photographer. Uh, we photographed them and then by the end of the many months of baking and photographing and eating all the cookies, we thought, okay, that's, that's enough cookies. We gave them to all our neighbors and all our friends. People were sick of cookies. But now they've had a little break and now it will be Christmas time. So I hope to make all the cookies again. <laughs> and and how do you decide when you're preparing a, for a book like that? How do you decide, okay, that's enough recipes now, or oh, I should just add this this one as well? It must oh, be really difficult. It is the the hardest part, yeah. And I mean, even up until uh, the very end, I was sort of like, oh, can I just sneak one more in, or should I just take this one out? Luckily, we had um, the the publishing company was like, okay, here's your number of pages. Try to keep it to that. This will help you as much as it helps us. And I thought, okay, that's good. So I kind of had that in mind and could pick, but yeah, it's really hard. And I wanted to have a good, yeah, a really good selection that, that represented cookies across the country. But I also wanted to sneak in, you know, my, my mother-in-law's best cookies are in there too. And my grandmother's cookies. And uh, so it's a little bit of everything. It definitely is a lot of, of, yeah, grandmothers. There's a lot of secrets from the grandmothers in there, I think. Oh, fantastic. So what's your favorite cookie? Oh, difficult to say. I think I really like the four big Christmas cookies. And I think that's that's maybe for the nostalgia. Um, Mylanderly, Spitzbuben, Zimtstern, and Brunsli. These are the four that you'll always find it during Christmas season here in Switzerland in the French part and the German part. And um, eating them just brings me back to my childhood Christmases. They're the ones my mom made. And uh, yeah, just the feeling of Christmas and and being at home and family that I think those, that's why they're, those would be my favorite ones. Delicious. Yeah, All spe delicious. Special memories with yeah. them. Yeah. That's right. Good. So where can um, our listeners find find your books if they, if they would like to order them? Because you mentioned that they're all in English as well as in German. That's right. Um, I mean, if you're in Switzerland, you should be able to find them at the big bookstores here. The Oral Fusli is the one of the big chains here. Um, and that would be available in, in the train station and at the airport. Um, there, I mean, they'll also be, it just came out. So I'm not sure what the delivery times are, but they'll be on Amazon and the book depository as well. You can order them. The publisher is called Bergley. And uh, you can order them directly from the publishing too. They will ship to Australia. It, they have a 10, a 10 franc flat rate for international shipping, but yeah, should be um, able to find it. And there's more information yeah. on my blog, Helvetic Kitchen. Fantastic. Okay. So, so if you can just tell us where people can find you online so they can get more info about those books and, and all your other recipes. That's right. Um, yeah. So my blog is helvetickitchen.com and I'm all over social media with that too at Helvetic Kitchen on Instagram and on Facebook. Fantastic. Well, I'll, I'll mention uh, your your web address and, and your social handles in the show notes for this episode uh, and also some of the, the meals that we've talked about because obviously it, the pronunciation can be quite different to the actual spelling. Um, so I'll, I'll put the, the list of those so people know what we've spoken about. And the show notes will be available at holidays to switzerland.com forward slash episode 31. Thanks again, Andy, for, for joining me. It's been fantastic to learn more about these delicious Swiss meals. And I know there's quite a few more that, that I'll have to order next time I'm in Switzerland. After hearing about all those Swiss foods, are you hungry? I definitely am. I hope you have enjoyed learning more about Swiss cuisine and the origins of some of the country's most popular dishes. I love the fact that every dish has a story behind it, that Berka muesli was created for medicinal purposes, that Rushdie began as a farmer's breakfast, and that raclette originated when alpine herdsmen melted their cheese by the fire and scraped it onto their bread. Mmm, yum. 
Andy is passionate about Swiss cuisine, and if you take a look at her website, Helvetic Kitchen, you'll find recipes for the meals we've chatted about today, plus many other dishes. You can also find all the info about her books, Helvetic Kitchen Swiss Cooking, Drink Like the Swiss, and her new book, Swiss Cookies. I'm waiting for the copy I ordered to arrive in the post, and I can't wait to start baking. I'd also like to give you the chance to win a copy of one of Andy's books. Head to the show notes for this episode at holidaystoswitzerland.com forward slash episode 31, where you'll find out how to enter the competition. There's a simple question to answer, and that's it. Good luck. Also in the show notes, you'll find Andy's tips for travellers with special dietary requirements. If you are celiac or gluten intolerant, or a vegetarian or vegan, Andy has provided some excellent info on what to look out for when ordering meals at a restaurant or when shopping at the grocery store. Thanks again for listening to the Holidays to Switzerland travel podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please tell your Swiss-loving friends or leave a review on your favourite podcast app. Until next time, tschüss! Thank you so much for listening. For more great resources on planning a trip to Switzerland, Make sure you visit holidays to switzerland.com where you'll find trip planning tips, destination guides, information on transport, including Swiss rail passes, and much more. You're also encouraged to join the Switzerland Travel Planning Group on Facebook where you can ask questions and chat to other past and future travelers to Switzerland. You'll find show notes from today's episode at holidays to switzerland.com forward slash podcast. And be sure to subscribe to the Holidays to Switzerland Travel Podcast so you never miss an episode.